All right, let's get started. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today on the last day of the IGF. My name is Lee Jun Kim, and I will be providing a general introduction of the program we hope to share with you, and of course, later moderating the discussion we are about to have. Before starting off, I would just like to give my colleagues an opportunity to introduce themselves and greet you personally. Go ahead. Hi, hi everyone, my name is Jerry. I'm from Hong Kong, China, and I'm one of the youth researchers at the UNDPPA as part of this project. Um, hello everyone, my name is Man Zhang from China, and I am a youth peace builder and a member of the Youth Advisory Group under the Asia Pacific Division of UNDPPA. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you and um, thank IGF Kyoto 2023 for giving us this opportunity to speak here and also want to th uh, thank all of you either sitting here in the room or watch online for joining with us in this session. Okay. Hello, thank you for everyone and uh, thank you for providing the great opportunity and my name is Ayundalai, I'm from Mongolia, I am youth peace builder at UNDPPA, thank you for all. Good morning, I'm Yukako. I'm from Japan. I'm also one of the youth peace builder from the same division. Um, I'm very great to be here today. Thank you. And we also have Linda on Zoom. Linda, do you want to come in real quick? Hi, everyone. My name is <coughs> excuse me, Linda Yella. I am a Associate Political Affairs Officer at the UN um, Department of Political and Peacebuilding Affairs, and I'm the program manager for this fantastic project that we've been uh, having for now three years. And I think Ijun will um, tell you all more about the project itself, but I'm happy to be here and I'm the online moderator if there are any questions from, from the audience online. So speaking of the fantastic project that Linda mentioned, thank you. Um, this project is called Futuring Peace in Northeast Asia. So just looking at the title, you'll notice that there are several components to it. Number one, the future. We leverage the concept of the future to host discussion spaces. Number two, um, we host discussion spaces about peace and peace where, in this context, Northeast Asia. Futuring Peace in Northeast Asia is a program organized and led by the United Nations Department of Political and Peacebuilding Affairs, and it is designed in line with the youth peace and security agenda. The YPS agenda recognizes the valuable contributions of young people to establishing and sustaining peace and hopes to empower them and engage them more meaningfully in relevant discussion spaces. Through this program, young people from China, Japan, Mongolia and the Republic of Korea were able to convene and discuss collectively how we envision the future of Northeast Asia. And the central methodology that um, throughout the program that, was, that led the overall process is called foresight. I think some of you may be familiar with the concept, but long story short, in a nutshell, here I quote, it is a structured and systematic way of using ideas about the future to anticipate and better prepare for change. So foresight is all about leveraging this concept or this idea of the future so that individuals, organizations, or societies as a whole can become more anticipatory and more resilient to change. The program, the, fa the first phase of the program was launched in 2021 um, in partnership with UNESCO. And UNESCO came in to provide capacity building opportunities through a session program they call the Futures Literacy Lab. And we have the opportunity to really understand what foresight is, what it means for us, and how we can leverage it in these contexts. Then phase two began in 2022 in partnership with a Swiss policy think, think tank, Forhaus. And Forhaus supported us in translating foresight activities into tangible policy recommendations that we can later share with a broader audience. So I want to speak a little bit more about phase two because that's what this is all about today. Phase two was focused on using participatory foresight tools. So there are many tools within the foresight methodology and there are many different ways of using it. And participatory foresight tools are focused on engaging as diverse a group of people in these discussions, making it interactive, hopefully fun, so that we can surface 
trends or signals that are sometimes not as visible. This was done, for example, through a workshop that we hosted and facilitated using the Futures Triangle. The Futures Triangle is a tool where we, for example, a single concept such as regional collaboration. For that single concept, we explore the weight of the past, what is holding us back from achieving that, push of the present, what is happening right now that is driving us to change, change the way we think, change the way we do things, and then the pull of the future. What do we want in the future? How, what kind of vision do we have for the future that is also adding to the desire to change? Then we had a really interesting intergenerational dialogue and it was my first time engaging such a wide range of audiences. We leveraged an online tool. It was slightly more interactive than a simple survey. It encouraged participants who are taking part in it to imagine themselves stepping into a time machine going forward a couple decades, and then once they look out the window of the time machine, the question, the first question was, what do you see? And through that process, um, we encouraged people to dream quite, quite vividly about how they see the future. And through that intergenerational dialogue, we were actually able to interact with almost 150 participants and of a very wide range of backgrounds, um, expertise, and of course, age groups. And I found it very valuable because while this is um, based on the youth peace and security agenda, we also recognize the need to, especially when building a collective vision of the future, it's very important to engage as wide a range of audience as possible. And then our youth peace builders, we moved on to the desk research phase. Based on the insights we gathered through the workshop and then the online dialogue with the intergenerational audience, we um, delved a little bit deeper in to understand the current landscape. What is going on in Northeast Asia? What are some opportunities that we have that could essentially launch us closer to the future we want to see, but also what are some challenges that we foresee and how to address them? That desk research um, culminated in a publication called Future of Regional Narrative Bu Building in Northeast Asia, Policy Recipes by Youth P Peace Builders. So we called it a policy recipe because we wanted to make it slightly fun. So it's quite easy to, easy to read. Um, the reader usability um, essentially is similar to a cook recipe book. And we tried to integrate the concept of using different recipes to essentially create a delicious cuisine. And in this case, the cuisine was a metaphor for the future of peaceful Northeast Asia. In the publication, if you want to Google it or find it online, you'll find four policy avenues that um, the youth peace builders came up to recommend how the region, whether through national policies or regional cooperative policies, can move us towards the vision that we, that we hope to see. The first is calling for regional cooperation for education. Um, specifically focused on cultural exchange to build a more um, cohesive regional identity and enable collaboration. The second encourages the establishment of a Northeast Asian Youth Parliament for climate change. We recognize that climate change is very um, relevant to the younger generation and of course future generations and we feel the urgency to do something about that and one way to address it and meaningfully engage young people is by establishing such a body. The third is calling for partnerships, especially cross-sectoral partnerships to support digital literacy programs. And the last, but certainly not least, is calling for a more consensus-based regulation and support of the metaverse landscape. The last two recommendations are particularly relevant to the Internet Governance Forum. So now I will pass it on to Man Jiang to continue the policy recommendation presentation. Thank you. Um, cool. Thank you. Um, thank you, Adrian. Um, so as Adrian mentioned, um, there's a policy rec recommendation about digital literacy program. Uh, so Jerry and I co-authored this policy recommendation, and I'll briefly talk about the background and why we focus on digital literacy. And, and Jerry will elaborate more on the details of policy recommendation. Um, 
So in the era of internet and information technology, our society is more than ever uh, interconnected and uh, digital integrated. So we, we recognize the uh, influence of digitalization in our daily life, uh, work and study, and, and acknowledge the positive impacts of digital platforms um, promoting communication and cultural exchange. However, um, it is crucial um, to address the negative aspects of the digital platforms, especially social platforms, uh, which offer serves as the breeding ground for um, hate speech, prejudice, uh, discrimination, antagonism, and violence. So our findings from uh, the Open Online Dialogue uh, conducted in 2021 revealed that the negative emotion frequently uh, stem from historical grievances, uh, recent conflict, nationalism, fake news, uh, misinformation, and disinformation. Um, moreover, the development of AI-generated um, content, uh, exemplified by ChatGPT, has the potential to propagate uh, misinformation, manipulate public opinion, and reinforce biases, if not carefully monitored and guided by human oversight. So although some efforts has been done to uh, tackle the escalating issues of hate speech and online violence, um, current measures implemented by um, social media platforms like TikTok uh, that relies on a combination of a AI user reporting and content moderators to regulate online speech. However, these measures remain insufficient as they often adopted a reactive rather than proactive approach uh, so often you see the changes uh, to the social media platforms um, in technology capacity and priorities often are too rapid for proactive policy changes. Um, in Northeast Asia, uh, the region where I belong and also the Peace Builder belong, also there are digital uh, literacy programs in place, but they're often limited to uh, separate efforts um, initiated by the uh, government, NGOs, um, or private uh, tech companies, for example, from the um, other conversation that I had over the few days uh, at IGF, uh, that I got to know uh, in China there is Internet Summit for Children and Youth held by uh, the Youth IGF China uh, that aims to build capacity for children and youth in digital space and internet governance. But that is quite, the efforts are quite limited led by uh, the government and also the NGO. Uh, not necessarily include the private sector. So that's, that's where um, our policy recommendation came in. We believe that the creation of high quality digital literacy programs um, in collaboration with the public-private partnership with a regional focus on education is integral um, to realizing a strong vision of, um, of regional culture and a peaceful future in Northeast Asia. So these programs in encompasses more than simply developing the skills to navigate, evaluate, create, and communicate di digital content on various platforms. Uh, it also entails uh, fostering uh, respect for differences, cultural diversity, and promoting an open and inclusive uh, mindset um, uh, uh, for the people in this region, and instilling confidence in our own understanding and sharing uh, our own culture um, in Northeast Asia. Um, so it aims to pre um, cultivate flexible conception of regional culture, uh, fostering a receptivity towards diverse cultures and nurture a sense of regional identity in Northeast Asia. And now I'll pass the floor to Jerry. Thank you, Manjang. So I will go into the three specific components of this recommendation. Um, before I do so, I wanted to highlight a few key points. So our digital literacy program is based not only on the fundamental building blocks of improving access to technologies, but also modern usage. So what are the modern technologies? What are the ongoing conversations about these technologies? And how can we efficiently and effectively utilize technology in, in these ways? And so. The program focuses on education, learning about technological developments and modern conversation in order to bridge engagement knowledge that already exists on broadcast media and written media. So public and partner 
uh, partnerships offer a way to utilize private expertise and developments into a public guided system so that developments are organic and from the ground up and can also consider regional and cultural differences. We noted many existing digital literacy programs throughout the many stages of this project. And we noted that while many are offered by private companies, there is a gap of knowledge that exists between these programs and those offered in schools. And so the components of our recommendations are firstly to have in-school literacy programs, digital literacy programs, and have different stages of these programs for different grades, covering basics of access to what are what are technologies to effective engagement online, to education on important concepts, such as what is the metaverse, what is disinformation, and what is misinformation. Bridging versions of, this, of these conversations we are having here at the IGF to the classroom uh, enables more voices to eventually be heard in further discussions in online spaces and new technologies. And this is an inclusive approach we really believe in. Our second component of recommendation is out of school digital literacy programs for the public. So in community centers, in libraries, in public spaces. And this approach serves to include more demographics to uh, in digital education conversations and so that we can further adjust material for certain regions and generations as well. Private stakeholders should be providing updates and information onto new technologies. And the third component of our recommendation is to include more voices on policies pertaining to safe digital spaces online. So as Manjang uh, adeptly discussed, there is a lot of online problems that we're facing, particularly with disinformation. And these discussions need voices from those precluded due to lack of access, language, or even knowledge or care. And we believe that this is not one of those issues where demographics have to seek out the tools in order to engage, and that we would be preemptive in equipping people with knowledge and with access and tools so that they can um, have a voice in this space. Governance in this space necessitates a grounds up approach that is not just reactionary. We have next stages in the works and we're very glad to be um, sharing part of the project here today. So now uh, Yukako will present the second uh, recommendation. Thank you so much. So from here, we will focus on the part of metaverse landscape in our recommendation. So when we consider our future, technological development is a topic we cannot ignore. So I will introduce the background and uh, policy gaps in this part of recommendation and Oyuka will explain the detail um, recommendation part. So Metaverse, often described as the future of the internet, is a network of virtual worlds blending the digital and physical realms. When it's still in, in, in its infancy and lacks of clear definition, many providers are rapidly developing technologies as we could see in this forum. When we imagine our future peace in this region, its potential benefits and risks are unknown still. By 2026, a significant portion of the population will be engaged in the metaverse, necessitating better management to prevent issues like hate speech, misinformation, and anonymity. Electricity usage for such a massive use of technology is a debate, but it may reduce CO2 emissions by replacing physical travels. At this time, the metaverse holds the potential for application in education and fostering intercultural dialogue. However, the educational utility remains insufficiently ex explored and there are the notable lack of developed educational content. Key challenges include regulation, privacy, and accessibility. One of the main policy gaps for metaverse, metaverse future is regulation, which is about how to regulate this decentralized, transnational, and technologically evolving space. Questions of state power, privacy, and data protection vary regionally and culturally. Universal digital access by 2020, uh, 2030 is a goal based on UN, our common agenda and government and international organization 
are working to improve internet accessibility, viewing digital space as a public arena. In this context, accessibility and affordability are also concerns. Currently, Metaverse is primarily being shaped by Western tech giant. Uh, however, its influence extends beyond the Western world. Monopolization of Metaverse platform could lead to ownership and operation issues. So in Northeast Asia, the unregulated Metaverse could exacerbate uh, geopolitical tensions and conflict, given the region's geopolitical importance and exi existing anonymities between nations. As Metaverse evolves, addressing these challenges is crucial for its responsibility, responsible and sustain sustainable development. So here I over to Oyuka for recommendation part. Okay, thank you for Ikoko and all, and I would like to highlight some components of our policy recommendations regarding the metaverse. And first component of our recommendation is develop Northeast Asian metaverse platforms. In many Northeast Asian countries have world-class technology, technological capacities, and, and yet they have been heavily influenced Western cultures. But also, it's so appre appreciative that some Northeast, Northeast Asian countries have already developed their own uh, metaverse platform. And each country in Northeast Asia should take the initiative to foster increased interaction between relevant industries, research institutions, ac academia, and governments in, in order to develop platform or originating from Northeast Asia and prevent monopolies and oligopolies by a small number of Western countries. And that is also um, so important I th uh, in, in terms of our recommendations. And first, the component of our recommendation is uh, focused on promoting the development of inclusive algorithms. Uh, of course, in metaverse, it's a very hot topic in currently in technology-focused world. And so openness and inclusive, inclusive algorithms is so important uh, in the metaverse uh, space. Um, in the metaverse, the physical distance doesn't matter anymore. And while traditional cooperation among countries in the Northeast Asia region can be tricky due to historical differences, territorial disputes, and increased tensions leading to hate speech and crimes, and uh, regional collaboration remains vital. And so uh, domestic discussions with uh, Northeast Asian countries have typically held in their native languages and creating limited exposure to views from other nations. To foster feasible um, relations, governments, and should collectively develop algorithms for cross-language cross information sharing and measures to counter excessive filter bubbles, and this legislation in each country and regional agreements foster the creation of shared narratives that support fees in region and also even the world. And the third component of our um, uh, policy recommendation is to focus foster regional collaboration in and multi-stakeholder dialogues between private sector and public sectors and even governments and youths and also and also intergenerational. It's so important. Um, yeah, in the metaverse where the physical and the virtual worlds are approximate, people from fields of the internet and new technologies and policy fields should be engaged and to be heard and consulted, including marginalized communities, youth, uh, people of different social classes, and gender and sexuality, and people with disabilities. And um, last uh, point of the, our recommendation is regulation. Uh, there, uh, there is no single players in the regulation of the metaverse, and uh, we need to more discuss about the regulation and uh, and uh, code of conduct. And uh, kind of this conference, uh, Internet Governance Forum, should serve as a model for a uh, similar regional initiative in Northeast Asia, and which could contribute intra and intra regional collaboration and help and create regulations correcting the imbalance and the potential conflicts 
of interest between powerful corporations and citizens. Yeah, that's uh, for uh, issues that we focused in our policy recommendations. And okay, thank you. Thank you, Manjiang, Jerry, Yukako, and Oyuka for presenting our recommendations. I find these opportunities fascinating not only because we share, we have the chance to share with the audience, but it also brings back memories, um, makes me reflect on the processes that we underwent to develop these recommendations. Um, we have some topics that we want to surface through a more open discussion, um, elements of the programs that we hadn't quite <coughs> been able to touch upon through the presentation. But before I launch into that, I wonder if there are any questions, immediate questions from the audience. Interactivity and engaging a wide range of stakeholders is the key value of our program. So you're welcome to address any questions you have. While being trained on futures literacy, I was instructed to not be afraid of silence. And I have come prepared to essentially really leverage the silence that we have. So like I mentioned, there are some elements that we want to really share with you of the program. So shall we start the panel discussion? Ready? So let's see, we are at the IGF. And specifically, I want to hear your thoughts on why internet governance should engage young people in building consensus, possibly regulations, and moving forward so that digital spaces can become safer and more inclusive. Any takers? Hi, thank you, Adrian. Um, I think that's a really, really important question that youth also face in so many other of these big systemic and pending issues, particularly with internet governance and technological developments and the whole gamut of challenges that brings. I think youth involvement and youth perspective is so important to ensure that those spaces are inclusive because the internet should not just inher inherit the existing problems of the physical and outside world. I think the younger generation can bring so much perspective to these changes. And as we all know, the younger generation, the youth is usually inheritors of problems and guinea pigs for decisions made on our behalf or for us. So definitely when we discuss concepts like the metaverse and pending policy proposals, youth perspective and youth engagement is key. Um, thank you, Jerry. Maybe I also want to um, give some comments on this. Um, um, I think you, young people, um, as Jerry mentioned, usually they're seen as a problem or they're too naive. But I do want to mention because we are young, um, that is where uh, we have um, we are open-minded. We are open to different kind of solutions and approaches. Um, and also we are innovative. We are able and dare to take in innovative approaches uh, in this context uh, for internet governance and also um, 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 the issue relevant to uh, conflict resolution and peace building. Um, and also you young people, they are the future leaders. So they should have, they should have their voices heard and um, um, uh, ensure their perspectives are taken into account during the uh, making uh, decision making process, and also I want to touch upon that um, in Northeast Asia region, um, I think usually uh, there are limited efforts uh, to bring and engage young people um, in the decision making process. Well, um, over this discussion uh, with other participants um, over the past few days at IGF, I got to know that um, there. Um, quite um, a lot of efforts has been done, uh, has been made in other parts of the world. For example, in, in Africa, there's a, a very active youth engagement initiative. Um, for example, the, uh, the youth, um, youth IGF in Africa, un under African Union in different um, countries in Africa. Also, there's um, um, Bangladesh youth-led um, initiative that also aims to 
uh, address the digital literacy uh, on, plat on digital platforms. So I, I do see there's a lot of um, things happening in other parts of the world, but I don't, we, we, I don't see at least um, um, in this region, in, in Northeast Asia, uh, youth engagement are not enough. So we need to take in um, the initiative and uh, to take actions to bring young people uh, into the floor, into the decision making process, into the implement impl implementation um, process. Thank you so much. So I really resonate with what JD said and Manjin said. Uh, so um, I want to. I have a two point. Uh, so first one is yes, as you said. Um, so younger generation, uh, this generation, in including this generation, I assume is uh, called a uh, digital native. So how we engage to the digital technology and how we construct reality is different from other generations. So our perspective should be considered to. Um, know that into policy making, first of all. And the second part is the perspective of um, age diversity, generation diversity. I think it lacks, not it's, it's not limited to internet governance, but especially in our region, um, because of the, the demographic change, and most of the country, maybe Mongolia is the exception, but um, most of the country is leaning toward like aging society, so it's easy, like youth voice, tend to be undermined uh, because of its structure, but especially for this, um, like the policy related to technology, uh, different perspectives should be considered. Of course, uh, in terms of digital literacy and technology, we shouldn't have a dig digital divide. We shouldn't um, exclude older generation because they are also kind of uh, vulnerable, um, like uh, in terms of digital technology, but age diversity in general, um, like youth voice is equally important to older generation. Um, okay. Um, yeah, I also uh, completely um, agree what you said, and youth engagement is super, super crucial in th uh, to the internet governance, um, especially in the internet area, and. Um, uh, around the world, and uh, seventy-one percent world's youth aged fifteen to twenty-four years were using the internet currently. C um, it's a big number of compared with uh, fifty-seven percent of um, uh, of the other other age groups. And so, as we know that the internet is a global network and that transcends borders and connects people, businesses, and the governments worldwide. And the decisions related to the internet governance have far-reaching effects on various aspects of our lives, including communications and cameras and sharing information and security. And so um, in order to uh, create opportunity for young people, we need to share uh, some kind of opportunities and uh, some kind of information and uh, create some capacity building and, and yeah, the share and also uh, some information about the internet governance and how to ensure our privacy in the internet space. This is more crucial yeah, in currently, yeah. Thank you. At this point, Let's see, I know we're slowly running out of time, but since we kept talking about why we need to engage young people, and this question stands for my personal interest and area of work as well, I want to ask, what does good or meaningful youth engagement look like? And no pressure that everyone has to answer, but I wanna get your thoughts and also to share with the audiences, based on your experience, what are some core elements that are necessary to ensure a program or an initiative is truly meaningful in terms of youth engagement? Maybe some keywords, a sentence or two, please. Maybe I will start. Um, 
I think the current situation in the region, in Northeast Asia, is um, young people, they're often excluded in the decision-making process, in the policy-making process. I think the meaningful engagement with young people should be in the very beginning, from the top-down, I mean, well, from the top-down uh, approach, while making policy and making decision, they should be consulted. Their opinions and perspective should be included into while we make, make the policies, what kind of internet, what kind of future that young people, they, w they, they, they want. I mean, this is the future of, I mean, young people, the next generation. So I, I think the meaningful engagement should, um, in the very beginning, at the very early stage, their voices should be heard. Well, to, uh, to realize that, I think there should be a mechanism um, there because you, can, you, can, you cannot do things um, without any frameworks or uh, organization to support that, right? So um, there should be framework uh, where um, the young people uh, voice and perspectives can be channeled into the gov government or private, uh, private sectors, uh, technology companies, um, decision-making process. Um, but I see for now, um, there's, uh, the efforts are quite limited. I think that's the, the direction that we should aim for. Including young people from the early uh, early stages, I think truly demonstrates the willingness and readiness of whoever the host is to truly listen to the inputs of young people and shape whatever it may be, a program, an initiative, a policy, but to shape it in the way that is relevant for young people. I very much agree with you. Is there any immediate reactions to this? If not, that's okay. We can move on. Mikako. Thank you so much. It was a very good question. I was thinking, like, what is that? So from the perspective, so I grew up in Japan, but now I live in Africa, South Africa. So like, as Manjin mentioned, there are a lot of youth initiative, youth leaders. Um, so I was wondering, what is the difference <laughs> between us? Uh, but in general, not only uh, youth engagement, youth participation, but the and uh, I, I just rather want to ask, um, you know, youth from other country, but as at least in Japan, the interest to the politics itself is quite low among younger generations, and so um, yeah, then. So we don't need to like immediately engage to decision making, but just like we need to be exposed to the opportunity uh, to be heard and also about the policy making because I think most of young generation just feel it's very far from where they are and experiences are um, like valued. I think it's culturally in our society. Uh, but like just to maybe like as Manjan mentioned, it should be more framework and opportunity, then we have more access to the tables and to be discussed. Not necessarily like only use talking about it, but we can just talking about like intergenerational dialogue because it's also um, like segregated based on age and most of the conference room and the meeting rooms. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, yeah, this was, the this opinion is not very like organized, but that's what I'm thinking. And thank you so much. Thank you. There were recommendations from Manjiang and Yukako on how to more meaningfully engage young people. Um, so essentially these are recommendations for organizers, um, other stakeholders from older generations, but I think it's also important to remind young people that while governance, the concept may seem very far-fetched from the daily lives of young people, especially because it seems to be the province of governments and state representatives. However, I do think it's necessary for young people to understand how those decisions can affect their daily lives. And with that awareness to continuously push and advocate for more meaningful youth engagement. And I think once there is the back and forth between these two groups, that is truly the way to create this intergenerational cooperation and an environment that enables that um, so that there is response from both sides.
Shall we move on to the next question? Before I do, I wonder if there are any questions from the audience. Hello, I'm Daichi from Japan. So I'm working on uh, internet service providers. Okay, so I'm just a uh, middle age, so 40 years old. And then, but my company established uh, before 20 years ago. My CEO operate for 20 years, and my CEO is 46 years old. You know, so he established in the younger age and it continued 20 years. Then, now he is the opinion leader in our industry. But how about the 20 years? Maybe nobody, nobody hear about his opinion. Yeah, yeah this is a challenge. But most important thing is the continue. Don't give up. Mm -hmm. And then collaborate and then have a conversation with each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is very important. And uh, I, I recognize that. So when I was 40 years, everyone is ready to hear our opinion. So please try and challenge. Yeah, this is my opinion. Thank you so much. Thank you. That's super, super encouraging. And I very much agree with you. Um, you'll notice that currently youth engagement or uh, youth inclusion is a very big trend. So I think it's really important for us to not only recognize the importance of youth engagement, but really um, utilize and leverage this momentum and ensure we can keep the momentum going through different programs, different speaking engagement opportunities like this, and also internal and also external dialogue. So thank you. Well, one I think maybe we might have time for one or possibly two questions. This is a question that hangs over us all. Um, Cross-border co cooperation, particularly in the context of Northeast Asia, currently where fragmentation globally and regionally is very much happening, um, such cooperation has proven to be quite challenging. So I want to get your thoughts, youth peace builders, on how our policies aim to address and essentially overcome the realistic challenges of the world. Thank you for that question. Um, and that definitely is a major question that we always get asked um, when presenting policy recommendations of this nature. And for me, I think that looking back to the beginning stages of the internet itself is a great guide in that there was a lot of consensus on global governance regarding certain parts of the structure of the internet. But then content, for instance, was left to nations and national policy um, so that it could be sensitive to cultural differences or religious differences and considerations. I think despite the fragmented nature of the Northeast Asia region on some aspects, that could just that could also be possible um, and left to um, national policies for certain um, cultural considerations. But with that said, a lot of our policies, particularly on digital literacy, education, and regional community building um, across borders, those are initiatives that have existed in our respective countries, but we, uh, our policy proposal just serves to improve on these existing um, efforts. For instance, in Hong Kong, uh, Meta in 2021 has a digital literacy program and it was applied and there were workshops held. The Women's um, Foundation in Hong Kong also had similar efforts to encourage women in Hong Kong um, to be part of STEM. The Hong Kong um, Bureau also has their own um, digital literacy program. So our policy recommendation on digital literacy programs, like the beginning foundations are all there. We just hope that there could be more public and private collaboration so that more voices, as we've said repeatedly, can be included. But 
yes. So I guess my quick answer is that I don't see that as a major um, problem. And a quick food for thought, I wonder if we can take a positive spin on the concept or the keyword fragmentation and consider it diversification. Um, diversification that respects and cars out spaces for diversity, but without the challenges of fragmentation, which hinders communication and cooperation. So just food for thought. Maybe I just want to add one more thing. Uh, well, uh, we do see the challenges of uh, cross-border uh, cooperation or international cooperation in the region, uh, given that we, um, the country, um, countries in the region, are in a very different. Uh, they're on in a, uh, at very different stages of development, um, economically, socially, and also culturally. So, um, to keep that in mind is. Mm, well, we, we, we wanted to have a, a kind of regional initiative, um, intergovernmental or international cooperation. But I think the thing I important is also to, to respect the locals' context, the differences, that all the society have their own uniqueness. Uh, although we want to have a kind of regional initiative and cooperation, but um, back to the digital literacy program, we can... Um, kind of integrate um, the local context into the uh, uh, dig uh, literacy programs or metaverse um, into, the, into the mechanism, um, while also we keep that in mind, um, the, the, o the overarching goal uh, is to create a more in um, inclusive and also open um, online digital space or platform. Yeah, I would like to add some insights and uh, yeah, cross-border um, cooperation um, is happening in uh, some kind of regions and for example Mongolia and due to some issues and for example skill gaps and cultural awareness and also some kind of mechanisms and so that um, it's so valuable that in West uh, and capacity building promoting that enhance the skills um, and knowledge of individuals and uh, users and organizations involved in the metaverse uh, context. And this can um, help bridge skill gaps and, and promote effective cross-border uh, cooperation. And secondly, I would like to put some points. Uh, there is inquiry, in, in, inquiry and promote, promote cultural awareness. Uh, and the sensitivity training for metaverse developers and the users. And this is um, more helpful that understanding the cultural nuances in the uh, Northeast Asian countries. Uh, countries can facilitate smoother, more smoother cooperation and collaboration, uh, digital literacy and the metaverse context, and, and even more um, sectors. And lastly, the point is going to establish uh, some kind of mechanisms and to for resolving conflicts um, and disputes that may arise during cross-border metaverse uh, um, activities. And uh, so arbitration and meditation processes can be valuable in these courses. Um, uh, if, and also, uh, in the West, uh, some kind of funding for educational education sector is more valuable because a metaverse is uh, newly born and new um, new sector that we are facing today. And so uh, we need to encourage and gain more knowledge uh, in terms of the metaverse context. Yeah, that is what I am thinking that. Thank you so much. I had a, I have a relatively longer time to think <laughs> about uh, my answer, uh, but this is very challenging question. Uh, but cross-border cooperation is challenging, but particularly in political layer, 
but economically, yeah, we already have a lot of cooperation in within the region, like because just manufacturing some like smartphone, those things, or like no no single country can manufacture single product these days. And especially like China, Japan, Korea, we have a lot of economic cooperation, and also Mongolia, like also as you mentioned, like those um, capacity building, those things. As uh, there are cooperation in some ways, but because we are peace builder. When we're talking about peace, we can't avoid, you know, like political issues. So, like, just that the conversation from politics makes the conversation more difficult. But the internet and then something related to education and capacity building can be like, how to say, like milder topic to start the cooperation. So uh, that's why I personally like this topic, like uh, technology and skill development. And also, like, we already have a kind of inter, like, university, like, those academic program among three nations, at least. So starting the conversation from, like, non-political layer, but it is definitely connected to the broader, like, concept of peace, like, ci citizen level awareness. And if you, like, this kind of initiative, like, we get to know each other, um, then I also really like your, like, no, your, like, food of thoughts, like, diversification. Actually, like having different unique culture, it's, I think it's very, like, it's nothing bad about it. And localization, we have a different value and culture, and it, it's natural, there, 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 there is diversity. Uh, but the issue is if it's like closed off and it's fragmented and divided, but the, if they are like just uh, in, in the system, rebel and internet governance, like if it's like interoperated, and also there are language barrier, but the technology can break through those differences. So uh, thinking about the cooperation from different angle, not only politics, then yeah, that, that's what I'm thinking. Thank you. Thank you all. And Yukako, I love your point about essentially being more creative on how we start conversations and um, proposing innovative ways on how we can maneuver around political barriers or other challenges that we foresee for regional cooperation. Thank you. We have just over five minutes left. Any questions from the audience? Not to worry, because I have another question to pose to our panelists. But um, just to be mindful of time, we let's keep our responses short so we can clear the room just uh, right on time. So last but not least, and also if the audience is very much interested in this program, I'm sure this question will be fascinating. But I want to hear from you guys. What are our next steps for these policy recommendations? Thank you, Adrian. So uh, as Yukako mentioned, there are existing cross-border regional collaboration groups already, in, and a lot of them do pertain to the education space. So research consortiums and research groups, university efforts. So we hope to um, collaborate more with existing groups to develop and be more informed about what is possible and what needs to also be further discussed. and source more voices and experts in the fields to make our policy proposals more um, informed. Mm -hmm. um. Yeah, I have uh, two points uh, about the next steps uh, of the metaverse. And first of all is um, we need to invest in some kind of funding to educational uh, sector. And it is still new uh, sector and so implement education programs to improve uh, digital, lit digital literacy and responsibility use uh, of the metaverse. And these initiatives should target uh, 
both young and young people and adults and also intergenerational peoples uh, should target that and, and it can help uh, to raise awareness of the potential risks and benefits of course and secondly contributing the developing code of conduct or regulating a framework is more crucial and industry standards that address privacy and data security and content moderation and digital property rights and within the metaverse is uh, crucial and so um, next is the fish um, uh, contribute, contribute some kind of uh, uh, code of conduct and uh, regulating of the metaverse and also education programs. Uh, I think it's more crucial for the next step. A quick note, um, let's try to keep our responses to a minute. I know it's hard, but... <laughs> Okay, yeah, because we are running out of time. After the next step, so our recommendation is not for recommendation, like it's, we shouldn't stop there. Uh, so to be, it should be implemented in some ways, then we need a cooperation and collaboration with other organization and that potentially other youth organization, maybe like youth IGF, and also other, of course, like different, also like not only like having dialogue, but have a more practical conversation with different organizations. But that's why we are here. Uh, so that that is going to be a next step. And I'm also open to talk each of you like attending these um, sessions. Yeah. Um, yeah, maybe just want to add the, the, the last point that um, for next step and a future um, plans, I we do see the realistic limitations for example, the funding investment and how to keep this program sustainable. Uh, but I just want to echo what Jerry mentioned is we can start with um, integrate our policy recommendation in, into the existing initi original initiative already that make it uh, easier and also we already have the stakeholders around and then we'll reach out to them and uh, just add the element of digital literacy and also metaverse in, in, in into it. Ma I think it could be make it more easier to implement and pr um, proceed further. Yeah. I think we are right on time. Um, I just want to reiterate um, thank you to the Internet Governance Forum for providing this platform for us to share our recommendations and insights. And to our audience, if you are interested in continuing to observe and also explore how young people can shape governance and beyond that peace building, especially in Northeast Asia, please keep up with Futuring Peace in Northeast Asia. Thank you.